This is the next in the Patriot Minute series. I'm Grandpa Rick. This is the amazing true story of Japanese American war heroes of World War II. It's a story that very few Americans know anything about or very little about. It needs to be discussed. We can take a few minutes. We all witnessed in the summer of 2020 the terrible destruction to our cities. This is by contrast to the story I'm about to tell. During 2020, dozens were killed, thousands were injured in these riots. Well over a billion dollars in property damage, often to America's poorest citizens, yet hardest working citizens, destroying and looting their small businesses, their only means of making a living. It was a politically driven, unnecessary disaster, in fact. In truth, our elites, our leaders, many excused the plotted Antifa Black Lives Matter mayhem during the build-up to the 2020 elections. These brutal attacks on our police officers, they were claiming that such was justified. No justice, no peace. George Floyd's death gave the anarchists and race hustlers carte blanche for being supposed victims meant that they could do anything they wanted, everything would be excused. Even our soon-to-be Vice President Kamala Harris bragged about donating money to spring Antifa thugs and shock troops from jail to get them back on in the streets destroying our cities right away. The summer of 2020 was a dark chapter in America's history, and it's now being whitewashed and ignored by America's leaders and by the mainstream media. And it will happen again, count on it, possibly next summer in the lead up to the 2024 national elections. That said, however, I think we need to go in a more positive direction, something that's more inspiring by contrast, and then this contrast is important, and it's contrasting as night and day. <laughs> what we've been taught all of our lives is the constructive Christ-like approach. This is an example from history that teaches us that. It's a story of the American dream. It's a uniquely American story of native-born heroes, a story of loyalty, of personal sacrifice and courage, the practically unknown true story of the Japanese-American fighting 442nd the most decorated military unit for its size and length of service in American history. Most Americans, I hope, of course, are aware of the rounding up and the imprisonment of Japanese Americans following J Japan's surprise bloody attack on Pearl Harbor, where 2,335 Americans, both military and civilian, were killed that day. And it was a surprise attack. The Japanese had a peace delegation in Washington at the same time they had a task force on their way to attack us. I mean, this was very extremely deceptive, and it made Americans angry. There were many American naval ships destroyed that day. There were five battleships. There were two destroyers, along with 12 other ships, damaged, destroyed, or sunk by the Japanese air attack that day, December 7th in 1941. It was the greatest military defeat executed by the United, against, against the United States by a foreign power in history. Truly as well, it was an unnecessary tragedy. We were caught by surprise. We were caught unprepared. Then following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, Franklin Delano Roosevelt decided that the 120,000 Japanese Americans residing mostly in the western states must be removed from their homes and held in relocation camps. They were a threat to national security, he claimed. And of these Japanese Americans, about 70% of them were native-born American. Americans of Japanese ancestry, yes, but who did not know any other country beyond the United States. This was such a powerful kick in the gut for these proud, loyal Americans who had not broken any laws, were hardworking, contributing members of our nation. Now suddenly they were dishonored criminals in their own land in the eyes of their government. They were victimized, truly, if anybody could claim to be in America's recent past. These were the victims. These camps that were built to hold them were not built in pleasant places. Most were in the desert, in undeveloped, desolate areas that nobody wanted. In the southwest of the Great Basin, infested with rattlesnakes, scorpions, poisonous spiders, very bad. The winters were frigid, the summers were sweltering, camp buildings were quickly thrown up, these, these, these clapboard buildings, and poorly heated, no insulation, lacking air conditioning through long, scorching summers, of course, and sometimes it's, sometimes it's got as hot as 115 degrees Fahrenheit in some of these areas. They were heated in winter with wood stoves and coal, or coal stoves. There was little to, there was little to, to zero. No, there was no job opportunities. Life was just plain miserable. In effect, these loyal Americans were being punished, even tortured by the conditions, solely due to their race, the color of their skin, the shape of their eyes, their foreign names. But after the first year of the war, the United States was being stretched to its limits. Many thought we could not win this war. It was a two-front war. We were fighting in far-off lands with limited resources. So the U.S. military sent recruiting representatives to these camps, asking these many young men that were there to volunteer to fight for America. <laughs> the military set up meetings at each camp, asking for volunteers. 
some of the young Japanese men, as would be expected, got up and cursed these recruitment officers, stating that hell would have to freeze over before they would risk their lives, fight for a nation that would imprison their families for no good reason, and illegally at that. Certainly, this was not constitutional. No way, they said. No way. But then, at each camp, and at first only a few of these young, thoughtful men would stand and say something like this. I understand how many of us feel about what has happened to our families. But consider this. How can we send a stronger message to our government, which has done us such great injustice, than to willingly sign up and fight to protect our beloved nation, the United States of America? How much stronger a message will that send? How much stronger will it send than just complaining about being victims, about not being treated properly? How, think about the other Americans whose sons were fighting and dying at that very moment, they would say, these Japanese men, but also to our enemies. We want to send a message to the Japanese and the Germans that Americans, including Japanese Americans, will always be different, always be willing to stand for freedom, to come to the aid of others. Always grateful to God for the freedoms and blessings that we and our children and grandchildren will one day enjoy. They went on to say, I know of no greater message to send our leaders and fellow Americans and the world at large than by joining up to fight. This is our country, and considering the terrible enemies America faces, it's the right thing to do. Unquote. And these young Japanese men did just that. By the end of the war, over 30,000 Japanese Americans had joined up to fight or to serve in some way. Many of them were in some of the, the bloodiest encounters, military units that had the bloodiest encounters of the war, like the fighting 442nd. The numbers don't lie. A higher percentage of Japanese American military personnel were decorated for valor as compared with other American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. Thousands of these young men were wounded or killed because of the dangerous and critical missions they volunteered for. Today, Americans of Japanese ancestry are some of the most successful, peaceful, and law-abiding of any minorities in our country, capable and intelligent, contributing members of society. Over one-third, in fact, were Christians at the time. Today, as when they were incarcerated in 1942, they were and are model citizens. They have strong families and higher than average standards of living from other American groups and ethnicities. They have high values, particularly family values. One of the finest books I've read in recent years is Facing the Mountain, the true story of Japanese American heroes in World War II. The author, Daniel James Brown, relates in story form the history of these brave Americans. Though persecuted by our government and by many of their neighbors and fellow citizens and even losing their homes and businesses and were being imprisoned behind barbed wire in these assembly centers, which were really American concentration camps, they determined to not be victims, to be a positive moral force to help our country defeat Nazi Germany and the Empire of Japan. And many of them had unique skills to do this. But perhaps more admirable, from these horrendous camps, the fathers and mothers there sent their sons, nearly all born in America, off to fight the Nazis and the Japanese. Parents willing to do this, even though they were locked up. As mentioned, these boys became the Fighting 442nd, as well as several other renowned units, Army, Marines, and others. Yes, these were among the most decorated Americans in World War II. Let's talk about the Lost Battalion. This is a fascinating story. In the fall of 1943, a battalion of Texan soldiers were caught behind enveloping German lines in the Vosges Mountains of southern France. They were surrounded and cut off from, the re from rescue, out of food and water, and they were running out of ammunition. The Texans dug in and determined to fight to the last man. But of course, they hoped to be rescued in time. But the problem was there were no other American units properly equipped and in position to rescue them before the Germans would, would, would overrun them. German artillery bombarded their position, and Wehrmacht troops prepared to swarm the Texans. It looked like they were finished. The Germans demanded the Texans surrender. They said to them, hell no. But then, out of the trees, unexpected, totally unexpected, certainly by the Germans, many of them low-crawling from the valley below so they would not be spotted. With stealth and skill and a rare courage born of men who believed in themselves, in their comrades and in their officers and in their mission, the fighting 442nd Japanese Americans knifed, they literally knifed through these German lines, driving the Nazis back, killing hundreds and rescuing the Texans. <laughs> when the Texans saw the faces of their rescuers, many were confused. Young Japanese men wearing American uniforms, what's going on? But soon they realized that these American boys, what they had done in their behalf and the lives that they had willingly sacrificed for them. For the 442nd had, had lost uh, nearly 800 killed and wounded, 800 casualties of their own, to rescue what became known as the, in the American media as the Lost Texan Battalion. One of these Texans said upon their rescue, with a cigarette dangling from his lips, he said, Hey kids, some balls you got. We thought we was all dead and gone. 
Another Texan blurted out to them, thank you, thank you, thank you. Erwin Blonder, the Texan scout and forward observer later when communicating with his commander who had been rescued as well, said in the to the radio, he said, tell them SOBs we love them. Perhaps summed up best, was summed up later by Rudy Tokiwa, a highly decorated recon scout for the 442nd. At the end of the war, as he stood in Hawaii with his family in full dress uniform being honored, he had ribbons and medals pinned to his chest, among them a purple heart, the combat infantry badge, and a bronze star awarded for bravery in battle. He said, quote, you know, it's coming out to be, it doesn't make no difference what you look like. It's what you're doing and what you've done for the country that counts. These American heroes, though without a doubt, were true victims, mistreated by their country from the beginning, still almost all determined to reject victimhood, which has become a sacred ideology for many Americans today. This is a terrible curse that's, that is being put upon our children in this country. Worst thing in the world you could teach a child is that they are a victim, especially when this is just life, really, and to work. Usually without fanfare, what these Japanese Americans did, they worked without fanfare, sacrificed, without credit in many cases, for their families and for their neighbors and for this country to make it better and more prosperous, to forget about self and, selfless, and selfishness and sacrifice to free struggling peoples and races being murdered and abused by these horribly totalitarian regimes of the Nazis and the Japanese Empire. In fact, these were some of the first units that liberated some of these terrible um, concentration camps in Germany, the 442nd. In the words of Sergeant Fred Shiyosaki, later he said when he was being honored, he said this, we made the sacrifices. It was a sense of, hey, I earned this. It's not that you owe me, it's this, that we have earned this. And earn it they did. By the end of the war, these loyal Japanese Americans helped create a far better world that existed that day on December 7th, 1941 when the Empire of Japan carried out its surprise attack against American bases in Oahu. These courageous giants, who were almost all small of stature, were willing to sacrifice their lives, and they did so in large numbers, to support the principles of the America they believed in, the America that was their home, and in the process, they proved to the nation and to the world that they deserved to be respected as honored American heroes. But also, within these 10 American concentration camps that were built here, and they housed approximately 120,000 Japanese American families and citizens. Well, by the end of the war, these citizens in the camp showed an amazing, humble, yet quiet pride in taking these poorly and quick, quickly constructed camps, slapped together in inhospitable places in the states of Utah, California, Arizona, Wyoming, Colorado, and Arkansas, and turning them into gardens and show places, really. They added insulation to these clapboard buildings, lots of paint, plumbing, and proper drainage, as well as foliage to beautify and to cool. They dug irrigation canals from the Colorado River, the ones that were near there, to provide water for planting crops, flowers, shrubs, and trees. Where there was nothing but sand, sagebrush, weeds, and rattlesnakes was now lush and green. They turned their absolutely horrible world into something to be proud of. Vegetable patches, patches carefully tended. Tea gardens were, were made with ponds supporting goldfish and even koi. Trees provided shade and protection from the constant wind in these areas. Burlap from old bags was collected and shipped there for women to, to, to weave into placemats and rugs. Flower gardens sprang up. Women manufactured thousands of camouflage netting for the war effort to protect our troops, the Army and the Marines, from air attack. They had used these camouflage nets to cover their positions or their gun placements. Hundreds, hundreds of young Japanese American women took nursing courses and joined the military to nurse the many sick and wounded. Skilled Japanese men and women, doctors, lawyers, farmers, carpenters, architects, electricians, plumbers, and florists all brought their expertise to improve the life in the camps and to contribute to the war effort where they were allowed. With beehive-like activity, a unique sense of honor and integrity arose. Yes, these Americans knew they had been unjustly treated, but they refused to be victims. For victimhood was shameful, it is shameful. They refused to, be, to, to demonstrate and to, and to destroy and riot. They refused to destroy the country that was their home. Their actions demonstrated that they understood that self-pity or defeatism is always a moral issue. It's unproductive, it's self-limiting, it's, it's a mindset that needs to be discarded as, as quickly as possible from this country. Victimhood must first be cured from within before it can be cured from without. Personal initiative and hard work, positive, righteous effort 
in a worthy cause. This is the only cure for our nation today and for our youth. Our youth need to understand these truths, and they're not being taught them. History, though often covered up, even discarded, proves that what these ethnic Japanese embraced was not only the true American spirit, really, but also the spirit of their ancestors, a righteous legacy of individual and family honor which they determined to preserve. They nourished their intellectual and spiritual lives daily, strengthened their families, and taught their children the truth about a good American nation. A perfect nation? No, but a nation that we should love, worthy of our love. They found salvation in their own innate creativity and worthy, long-suffering accomplishments. They studied America's founding documents in order to hold America's leaders to its sacred values, primarily that all men are created equal, and our leaders sometimes need to be reminded of this. In the end, these admirable Americans so impressed the world, including our enemies, the Germans absolutely feared the five fighting 442nd, prove for all time that the road to victimhood will always be the fool's highway. In the words of a German commander who faced the 442nd, he knew, Lieutenant Colonel Friedrich August Freyherr, who was the commander of the German 6th Parachute Regiment. This was a hard-fighting unit of the German Wehrmacht. He was a consummate warrior, in fact, this man. You can see in his picture the scars on his faces. He fought continually, nearly for six years, for the German Wehrmacht, for the military, wounded, and they wounded several times. He said, talking about the fighting 442nd, quote, We rarely captured these men. They were cunning very well trained and disciplined. You could hear most American soldiers coming down the road a kilometer away. They made so much noise. But these Japanese, you never even knew they were there until they were right next to you. And then it was too late." Unquote. Thank you. Thank you, Americans of Japanese ancestry, for teaching us what our founders knew and understood. It's why this country was born and nurtured in the first place. America lives and blesses the world because of the blood and sacrifice of many men and women of all races, creeds, and religions, going back to the revolution and before. From Plymouth Rock to Jamestown, through Fort McHenry, the Alamo, and then to Gettysburg, from Promontory Point to Quezon, and recently to Fallujah, America, while certainly not perfect, we know, is indeed worthy of our love. For America is not just a dream, it's a miracle. I appreciate your time. I'm Grandpa Rick.